Well, good afternoon, everyone. Maybe we're coming up on good evening. Uh, we appreciate everyone's patience, and um, uh, we're excited to be here. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all here today. I've had the pleasure for the last three and a half years to be the United States Ambassador to the Republic of Singapore. Now, we're living in a very complicated time in history. Terrorist acts, brutal war, and senseless humanitarian suffering royal are every day. Our resolve is being tested like never before, from Ukraine to the Middle East to the South China Sea. Tough decisions and complex situations. Yet few understand this better than our special guest. And few are more qualified to help tackle these enormous diplomatic challenges. We are truly honored to be joined by the Secretary of State Anthony Blinken. As his first visit to Singapore in his capacity as America's 71st Secretary of State. His presence here today is a strong signal of the important and enduring partnership between our two countries. A partnership since Singapore's independence 59 years ago next week. Thank you, Tony, for being here. We're also grateful to our host the Asian Civilization Museum, and to our organizing partner, the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. It's now my pleasure to welcome Professor Danny Kwa, who has the honor of introducing our distinguished guests. Ambassadors, Excellencies, Distinguished Guests, Colleagues, and Friends. Good evening. My name is Danny Kua, and I'm Lee Ka Sheng Professor in Economics and Dean at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. It's my great pleasure this afternoon to welcome you all to this event, jointly organized by the U.S. Embassy here in Singapore and the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore. We are delighted and honored that in a few minutes, we will be getting to hear Secretary Blinken in conversation with Ambassador Chan Heng Chi. To begin the proceedings, I will in invite Ambassador Chan up on stage to introduce and then in a minute, welcome Secretary Blinken. Ambassador Chan is of course well known to all of us here. She served as Singapore's ambassador to the United States for 16 years from 1996 on. Ambassador Chan is ambassador at large at Singapore's Ministry of Foreign Affairs and professor at the Lee Kuan Yew Center for Innovative Cities at the Singapore University of Technology and Design. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Chan to the stage. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Ambassador Kaplan has very capably uh, introduced the subject. And so it is now my honor and privilege this afternoon to introduce the 71st Secretary of State of the United States of America, Anthony Blinken. Secretary Blinken, as you know, has had a long and distinguished record of service in U.S. administrations. He served as the National Security Advisor to Vice President Biden during the Obama first administration. I was there. And later as Deputy National Security Advisor and Deputy Secretary of State in the Obama <clears throat> second administration. He is in Singapore for a bilateral visit. He held the critical and emerging technologies dialogue with Singapore officials. And you would have just heard or read that the Singapore and the United States signed a peaceful nuclear cooperation agreement to explore potential civilian uses of nuclear technologies. Certainly, I agree he, we cannot have a better or more qualified person to answer the questions on top of our minds and to talk of U.S. 
foreign policy. We will have a conversation for about 20 minutes or so, 25 minutes, and we'll take a question from the floor. So I now invite Secretary Blinken to take his seat for our conversation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Secretary Blinken, you have just visited uh, Laos to attend the ASEAN ministerial meetings. That's great. You know, in recent times, the Biden administration seems to have worked a lot on creating minilaterals to meet your security mm -hmm. objectives. Quad, AUKUS, then you've expanded and uh, deepened, renewed your relationship, the security relationship with Japan and Korea. And that is the Australia, Japan, Philippines, and US grouping, which was formed for maritime cooperative activity. What is the place of multilaterals in US strategic thinking? Well, first, it's wonderful to be with you, to see you again here. It's wonderful for me to be Back in Singapore, I was uh, reflecting and thinking about it, and the first time I was here was actually 44 years ago, as a very young man, of course. Um, and I've had uh, opportunities, of course, to be back since, but this is my first visit in this, in this job, and I'm gratified to be here because of the strength uh, of our partnership and the value that we uh, attach to it. Uh, and I wanna come to your question, uh, because I think it's right at the heart of everything we're doing. When, when President Biden took office, the first thing that he instructed me to do, and all of us to do, was to renew, reinvigorate, and in some cases reimagine our alliances and partnerships, and that has been a critical part of uh, our efforts from day one, including here in the Asia Pacific, uh, the Indo-Pacific, and you mentioned uh, some of them, and what we've tried to do is um, not only to reinvigorate existing alliances and partnerships, but also to create new arrangements of countries um, that are really fit for purpose, that are focused on particular issues. But the multilateral system is also critical to what we're doing, uh, including, of course, at, uh, at the United Nations. And we see that as an integral part of our engagement um, around the world, because th there are two things that I think motivate us profoundly. One is that there is uh, a premium, I think, on American engagement, American leadership. Certainly it's one that makes sense for us, but I also believe it makes sense for countries around the world. If we're not engaged, if we're not leading, then probably someone else is, and maybe not in a way that advances the interests and values that, that we have and that we share with Singapore. Maybe just as bad, no one is, and then you're gonna have a vacuum that's filled by bad things before it's likely filled by good things. But the flip side of that coin is that I think there's a greater premium now than there's been at any time in the 30 or so years that I've been doing this on cooperation, on collaboration, on bringing common approaches to what are shared challenges. The multilateral system is one key vehicle for doing that. And I think you've seen our re-engagement across that system, even as we've also been reinvigorating alliances and partnerships. Now, uh, Secretary, you have uh, given us a vision, but the security vision, the alliance, hmm. the partnership uh, vision of the Biden administration for the Indo-Pacific. What is the place of trade in that vision? Trade is critical. It uh, links countries, it links people, uh, it links uh, economies. And I think we have to though, think about two things. One is we want to be focused on um, what's actually happening in this 21st century, including when it comes to trade. So one of the focuses that we brought to this is on the digital economy. And through things like uh, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, that's one of the things that we're, we're trying to drive forward, uh, understandings on that. Second, there are things that are so necessary and that have become so clear to us, especially with the experience of COVID, that are absolutely essential if trade is going to flourish and go forward. For example, resilient supply chains. We know what happens when we don't have them. We know the impact that that has on trade. So we've worked very hard to strengthen supply chains, to uh, rethink them, to build resilience, 
to build early warning into them with many other countries. So if there's a challenge to them, we're doing something about it. But there's something else that's important to keep an eye on. Um, trade is vital. So is investment. Uh, right now, the United States is overwhelmingly the leading provider of foreign direct investment in Singapore by, I think, five times the next nearest country. At the same time, uh, we're also the biggest provider of foreign direct investment across all of the ASEAN countries. The United States also happens to be the biggest recipient of foreign direct investment. Why is that important? Because you don't make, these investments don't happen unless there's a certain amount of trust uh, and also unless there's a certain amount of optimism about the future. I think we see in the magnitude of foreign direct investment a tremendous amount of trust between the United States, Singapore, countries in, in ASEAN, a tremendous amount of trust in the United States and confidence that this is where the future is. So as much as I would look at trade, I would also look at foreign direct investment. You're right there. But I would like to explain to you, mm -hmm. Secretary, that in the thinking of Southeast Asians and Asians, trade mm -hmm. is extremely important. Mm -hmm. Lee Kuan Yew in the 1980s, you know, gave a congressional joint session, joint address. And he spoke about democracy and trade going hand mm. in hand. You cannot promote democracy if you don't promote trade. Yeah. So I get very discouraged when I hear Americans say, we can't do trade. Mm. You know? Well, of course, I, I agree uh, with, uh, with his uh, insight. I think that's, that's very much true. It remains true. <laughs> we remain um, a great trading nation, uh, as, is, as is Singapore. I think, though, what we have to also be focused on is making sure that trade works for our working people, uh, that it works for our companies, that it works for our societies. And we also have to make sure that we are um, adequately dealing with sometimes second and third order consequences uh, that come with it. Um, I'll give you an example. Right now we have uh, a challenge when it comes to, uh, to China with overcapacity. Mm -hmm. That is producing in certain sectors and in certain industries well beyond not only the, the needs of, uh, of China but of world demand and doing it in a way with subsidies and other uh, forms of support that not only create unfair advantages but create a, an environment in which when that kind of trade uh, goes forward it has the potential to flood and as a result ruin entire communities, companies, workers who are on the receiving end of something that's not fair or, or not balanced. We have to also be able to deal with, with those kinds of challenges to the trading system. Uh, certainly, but uh, we hope that the way countries respond would not be through protectionist mm -hmm. measures, mm -hmm. you know, more protectionist measures. Now, uh, let me go back to the earlier discussion on the vision of uh, the lettuce fra framework that the United States mm -hmm. has created for security. Now, strategic deterrence under U.S. leadership is something I think I understand mm -hmm. why you are doing this. Mm -hmm. Like-minded countries come together so that they can deal with a fast emerging uh, challenge, uh, adversary, or you know, or, or a threat. But is the United States also build, starting to build confidence building mechanisms with a potential, your potential adversary? Absolutely, and that's critical, it's, it's vital. Uh, and let's take, again, the, the relationship with China. For us, it's both uh, arguably the most complicated and most consequential in the world. Actually, many countries can say the same thing. It, there's an obligation that we have, and that is to make sure that we're managing that relationship responsibly. We're in a competition, and, and by the way, there's nothing wrong with competition. In fact, in our system, competition's a good thing. As long as it's fair, as long as it's on a level playing field, it's a good thing. It hopefully brings out the best in everyone. We want to make sure that that competition doesn't veer into conflict, which is profoundly not in our interest or, or anyone else's, nor in China's. And that starts with communicating. It starts with being able to, to speak clearly, directly, and frequently to each other. Uh, just since last June, I think um, I've uh, seen my Chinese counterpart, Wang Yi, the foreign minister, six times. I was just with him uh, in Laos at the ASEAN meetings. Um, we, we speak on the phone. Many others in our government 
um, are engaged with their counterparts in China, and that's usually important precisely for, the, for that reason. Second, uh, there are aspects of this that are especially important. For example, we resume military to military contacts at all levels. That's so vital to making sure there are not misunderstandings that, again, could lead inadvertently to conflict. And we're also looking to find areas where we can cooperate. Um, when it's in the interests of our people, when it's in the interest of, of China, when it's in the interest of so many others. We've been doing that as well. For example, uh, we have a plague in the United States of synthetic opioids, fentanyl. The number one killer of Americans between the ages of 18 and 45 is fentanyl. It's not heart attacks, it's not car accidents, it's not cancer, it's not guns, it's fentanyl. And it's a global issue. And we have to deal with, for example, the question of the ingredients that go into making it, the chemical precursors that are often manufactured in China, may come to Mexico, get synthesized into fentanyl. Well, President Biden and President Xi reached uh, an important agreement when they met in San Francisco at the end of last year uh, about working together on this and China taking important steps, some of which is taken to try to curb the flow of these ingredients, these precursors. So we very much believe in the importance of engagement. And, and finally, on the many places where we, yes, have real differences, yeah. It's important to talk about them. Make sure at least we understand each other, that we know where each other is coming from, even if we disagree. You know, Secretary, I'm glad you said that. There was a collective sigh of relief <laughs> in the region when the Biden Sea Summit mm. took place in San Francisco. And my American friends tell me that a stability has been breached. Mm. I think the Chinese side also says, you know, this is good, we've reached stability. But sometimes I wonder whether you are each saying it to convince yourself. <laughs> but uh, the, um, yes, and uh, I think that's a good way to go forward. And I like mm -hmm. what you say about competition without conflict. Mm -hmm. But many of us believe it is still a very fragile stability. Yeah. So let me go further on this because in ASEAN, Many of the countries here have grown, done well. You know, we are one of the fastest growing regions in uh, the world, as seen by That's IMF right. and World Bank. We build, ASEAN countries are building a huge middle class. Hmm. You have it in Indonesia, Philippines, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, and of course, Singapore. But this middle class is built on globalization. Mm. And also because we are part of a production process, you know, producing goods to be sent to the United States mm -hmm. and other markets, mainly electronic goods. So we are very worried about the small yard, high fence mm -hmm. policy, because we see it becoming a bigger yard mm. and higher fences. Where, where will it stop? It's very important to understand what this is and what this isn't um, because we want to make sure that even as we're taking what we believe are necessary measures to protect our security, uh, we're not doing it in a way that um, undermines, inhibits um, trade that we were just discussing a few minutes ago is so vital, uh, investment and progress and opportunity for people around the world. So when it comes to the um, small yard high fence, look, it makes sense, and I've said this directly to uh, our Chinese counterparts, that uh, it makes sense for us to try to make sure that when it comes to the most sophisticated technology that is being used because there's fusion between the military and the civilian space in China, that is being used and goes directly to military applications, including, unfortunately, a very rapid and very opaque buildup of their nuclear program, how is it in our interest to provide that? No country would do that. At the same time, we really are focused on making sure that this is a small yard and a high fence. And that means being very attentive to what's controlled and, and what isn't. It means listening to the private sector. It means listening to other countries and working with them. Uh, and I'll give you, uh, you know, another example. We have um, controls, listings of one kind or another uh, against a, about 1,300 companies in China. There are 43 million registered companies in China. It's an infinitesimally small number 
uh, with regard to the, the Chinese economy. But we have a responsibility to protect our security, and other countries feel the, uh, feel the same way. But if you look at the overall numbers, our trade with China reached record levels just uh, a couple of years ago. Um, investment's been down, but there are a lot of reasons for that that have nothing to do with um, any controls that, uh, that we impose. Finally, um, what's so important here is that when we do these things, uh, we do them in collaboration with, in coordination with other countries who you know, may have similar concerns. And that's what we're focused on doing. Yes. No. We understand national security mm -hmm. concerns, Secretary, but sometimes given the uh, contests between two parties, you know, in two sides in the United States, the definition of national security becomes looser and looser. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we are worried about. Yeah. And, we, and, and, and certainly we know that, and it's something that I'm focused on. Uh, the, the question, for example, of deciding and defining what constitutes a dual-use item and how challenging is the potential other use, that's something, yes, we have to focus on very seriously and, uh, again, do it in a way that, as we would say, doesn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah. Now, I'd like to switch the uh, discussion to the United States, you know. There's a lot of noise coming out <laughs> of the presidential campaign. Really? I hadn't, I hadn't heard any of it. <laughs> yes. Can you give us an idea of where the United States as a country, a great power, a superpower stands in terms of engagement with the world, with trade, a defense ally, and as a global policeman? So we have these um, periodic things called elections. And I think it's normal that before every election, given uh, the importance of this moment in history that our country uh, has around the world, that of course, people, uh, people ask questions. They wonder what's gonna happen in a given election, what direction does the country take? Uh, and maybe there are lesser or higher degrees of that on any given election, but it always happens before every election. And um, I understand that. I think that there are a number of constants that don't fundamentally change, irrespective of, uh, of who wins a particular election. One is that if you look at um, most of the, uh, the polling, if you listen to our, our fellow citizens, um, they actually want the United States to be engaged in the world. Uh, they understand that um, in order to actually get things done at home, we also have to be working with others uh, around the world. And that remains by far the majority opinion. They strongly prefer that the United States not engage um, uh, the world al alone. Uh, they, want, they, kn they know the benefits in partnerships, in alliances. Uh, and again, that's a constant. And I think that remains no matter what. The, uh, the flip side is equally important. What I'm hearing is I have the great honor of going around the world on behalf of the United States is that most countries actually want us engaged. Yeah. Uh, they want our leadership. They want our partnership. And that's a very positive uh, signal that resonates back in the United States. So, look, I, I really I do understand the the focus uh, on this, but um, I'm also very confident that at the end of the day, most Americans see the benefits of our engagement around the world. Well, you know, you will understand that amongst your friends and countries around the world, they are concerned whether there'll be a continuity of policy. Mm -hmm between administrations, you know, whether it is climate change, technology, mm. policy, or whatever. Uh, and so some countries worry when they are negotiating deals mm. with the United States. Will that stand if it is another administration? Mm -hmm. it's, the it's the nature of our system, and I think people have seen that, know that over many years. We have so many actors in our system that are, that are important. And of course, the, the federal government um, stands at the top, but our states play incredibly important roles. Our cities play incredibly important roles. Their connections that um, have grown stronger and stronger over the years between our states and other countries, between cities uh, in different places, that continue to drive things forward, sometimes irrespective of what the national policy may be. Climate's a great example of that. Uh, and look, if you're sitting in the United States and you care, as so many Americans do, for example, about climate change, and Singapore and the United States are two countries that have been a leading edge in doing something about it, 
we know uh, for our part that even if we somehow did everything right at home uh, in terms of emissions and in terms of global warming, we're 15% of global emissions. Um, that means that we somehow have to find a way to uh, encourage the other 85% of emissions uh, to be dealt with, and that means working with other countries. You played with a rock band <laughs> in your younger days. <laughs> cool, you know. And recently in uh, Beijing, mm. you were going to music shop mm. with Ambassador Nick Burns. That's right. You bought Taylor Swift CDs and Dou Wei. I don't know if anyone's heard of Taylor Swift, but <laughs> I gather she uh, might have come to Singapore recently. Yeah. And uh, you bought Dou Wei. Mm -hmm. That's right. Rocker. Who's I terrific. I haven't heard of him so until you... I say, if Secretary Blinken buys it, I'll see. Well, it was a recommendation from the, uh, the, the, the very nice gentleman who owned the, uh, uh, the record shop, but he's terrific. He's terrific, great music, good beat, and the lyrics are very good. Do you still play in a band? I, uh, <laughs> you know, um, occasionally I've, done, I've gotten up and, and, and done some kind of charity event, but what I've found is if I ever have a room and there's an event that's running overtime and we need to, we need to clear the room, the best thing for me to do up is uh, do is get up and play the guitar. It clears the room immediately. <laughs> Electric guitar. Someone told me, an opera singer told me this huh? actually, just two days ago. Well, it's it's been a life lifelong passion and something that um, only enhances your own appreciation for music. And you know, everyone has a th different thread in their life. Yeah. For me, and as I know for so many others, it it, it has been music, and it's a a great source of joy, uh, of comfort. Sometimes we have. Uh, div more difficult days than others in this, in this business and being able to have music uh, to go back to, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Secretary Blinken. I'm going to allow some questions. Very good. Question from the floor, left side, please. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm Yvonne, and I'm a student at Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, and I'm doing a master's in public policy. So, uh, Secretary Blinken, uh, adding on to um, Madam Chan's, uh, Ambassador Chan's, uh, you know, your passion for music, my question is, you have shared how music plays a profound role in your life and its power to connect people across cultures. Uh, we can see how Korea... Uh, effectively use music as a soft power, right. uh, soft form of um, a form of soft power. So, how do you see your personal passion for music influencing your approach to diplomacy and international <laughs> relations, especially in fostering cross-cultural understanding and cooperation? Play us a piece Thank now. You. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're right. It's it's a great connector. I think in general, uh, the arts, culture. One of the greatest connectors we have, and, and music, I've, I've, seen, I've seen it do this powerfully because it transcends borders. It transcends language. It transcends difference in, in, in politics. And especially at a time when the world is so charged in so many ways, having those connectors, I think, is more important than ever. And I've really seen it break down barriers uh, in ways that um, have a, a, pr a profound impact. I see it in my own engagements with some of my counterparts. Some, sometimes it's one of the things that connects us is, um, is music. But uh, you mentioned as well the soft power aspect of this, uh, and K-pop is a great example of that. In fact, uh, I guess this is a couple of years ago, um, I was on uh, one of our late night television shows, something I hadn't uh, really done before. You know, shows like, um, uh, Dave, used to be David Letterman, The Tonight Show, all of these uh, uh, shows, and I was on one of the programs. And as we arrived at the studio, uh, there was a huge crowd outside. And I thought, oh, that's, that's nice, this crowd. And then I realized they had no interest in me. There was a Korean K-pop band that was also on the show <laughs> that night. It's a good reminder of things. But we have uh, programs at the State Department uh, that I think um, are among the best things we do. We have an entire department um, focused on educational and cultural affairs. And they're the ones who do the exchange programs. Uh, like uh, uh, all of the fellowships that many people have uh, benefited from, but they also do uh, exchanges with artists, with musicians, um, with, uh, with actors, with painters. And I've seen this have as much and maybe even sometimes a greater impact than some of the things we do on a policy level. So I'm a great believer in it, and um, I think it's profoundly to our benefit. Thank you. Secretary, can we have one more question? Of course. Pleasure. From the right side, yes, the hand up. 
Thank you, uh, Ambassador Nicholas. Uh, I am Director for Security and Global Affairs at the Singapore Institute of International Affairs, a think tank here. Um, you, we talked a little bit about continuity of political leadership in the US. Um, I, I want to ask you to crystal ball gaze into the potential outcome in November, huh. but we've also talked about the two major conflicts that are going on in, in Europe and the Middle East. Um, what do you think would be the likely uh, progression of those conflicts and the US impact in those conflicts as a result of the elections, whichever way it might go? Thank you. Well, look, one of, the, one of the benefits of my job is that um, I don't do politics. I just focus on policy and uh, try my best to help develop and then advance the best policies we can to deal with the many challenges that, uh, that we're facing. And certainly predicting an election in our country is something I wouldn't hazard to do. Um, our elections have been very, very close, and I expect uh, this next election is likely to be the same, just looking at it as an American citizen. Uh, but what I'm focused on and what President Biden's focused on really are the next, uh, the next six months between now and when the next president takes office in making sure that we're doing everything we can uh, on all of these fronts uh, to try to advance peace, to try to advance security, to try to advance not only our own interests, but the interests of so many of our friends and partners. I'll say very briefly, when it comes to the, the ongoing aggression uh, by Russia against Ukraine, uh, our support for Ukraine remains resolute. You've seen that in the uh, very strong, uh, albeit delayed, bipartisan support for the supplemental budget that we put forward for Ukraine. We see it in everything that came out of the recent NATO summit. We see it in the agreements that now more than 20 countries have signed to support Ukraine over the long term in making sure that it has a strong defense uh, and deterrent capability. And ultimately, whatever happens over the next uh, six months, I believe strongly that Ukraine will be a successful uh, country, and the successes I would measure by looking at is it standing strongly on its own feet, militarily, economically, democratically? Is it integrated with the institutions that it wants to be integrated with? And I believe it's on a trajectory to do just that. The support of so many countries around the world is vital. When it comes to the Middle East, we're working virtually every minute of the day to try to bring this to a better place, and in particular, to get a ceasefire in Gaza, to get hostages coming home, to try to put Gaza and more broadly the other areas of potential conflict in the region uh, on a better track. And from my perspective, uh, it's imperative that, uh, that we, we get that done and we're, we're working at it. And we're doing that, again, irrespective of any of an election uh, in our country, we're doing that because that's our responsibility in this moment. And as long as we have that responsibility, We'll continue to do our best to get to the right place. Thank you. We have one more minute left. Short question, yes, <laughs> in the center. Do you have a loud voice? Yeah, Please speak up. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Senator. Uh, thank you, Secretary uh, McKinn. So my name is Scott. I'm also a student uh, from the New School of Public hmm. Policy. And I'm a uh, yep, sure, Just yes. online audio. Yes, so my name is Scott. I'm a Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, Masters of Public Policy candidate. And my question to you is somewhat related with your previous answer. I know that this session is talking about the Indo-Pacific strategy, but um, of course today uh, we've heard uh, some scary kind of breaking news about uh, um, the senior Hamas official being uh, killed uh, in Iran. And so I just wanted to get your sense because I believe this would be the first time uh, that I get to hear um, about what your perspective is and how this changes the negotiations um, because he was at the forefront of uh, Hamas uh, negotiations. So thank you. Well, of course, I've seen, uh, seen the reports. Uh, and uh, what I, all I can tell you uh, right now is I think nothing takes away from the importance of, as I said a moment ago, uh, getting to the ceasefire, which is manifestly in the interests of the hostages and bringing them home. It's manifestly in the interests of Palestinians who are suffering terribly every single day. Children, women, men in Gaza who've been caught in this crossfire of Hamas's making. It's profoundly in the interest of uh, trying to put things on a better path, not only in Gaza, but actually throughout the region because so much is tied to what's happening in Gaza right now. Uh, we've been working from day one not only to 
uh, try to get to a better place in Gaza, but also to prevent the conflict from spreading, uh, whether it's uh, in the north with Lebanon and Hezbollah, whether it's uh, the Red Sea with the Houthis, whether it's uh, Iran, uh, Syria, Iraq, uh, you name it. Uh, and a big key to trying to make sure that that doesn't happen uh, and that we can move to a better place is getting the ceasefire. I'm not going to speculate on what impact any one event uh, might have uh, on that. I've learned uh, over many years um, never to really speculate about that because we simply don't know. What I do know is the enduring imperative of getting the ceasefire, and what I do know is we'll continue to work at that every day. Thank you. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid I will have to bring this discussion to a close. I've been told, <laughs> you know, so uh, let us show our appreciation to Secretary Blinken. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great to be with you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.